Hi everyone, Matt Andrew Jeske here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in this video lecture about the issues of race and ethnicity um, as it pertains to the reading and the prep guide in Gen Ed 130. So your textbook and many social scientists refer to race as a myth and the, uh, the notion here is that there's really nothing um, physically or biologically uh, 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 available to determine what race you are or anybody is for that matter. It turns out that the human genome is uh, fairly diverse and issues like skin color and hair color and so on basically come from um, the, the how near the equator your uh, ancestors uh, lived uh, years ago. Um, there are no such thing as a pure race. Race is not a biological term. Um, it is a term that is used in society to differentiate people for one reason or another. And most people think that those differentiations uh, those differences that people are pointing to are not real, that are, are largely made up um, for certain purposes, political, economic, social purposes. Um, and uh, that's the, the myth of this, is that there's just no pure race of Homo sapien or of any, any other thing. I mean, we would all call ourselves Homo sapiens, which is a species. Is there something below in, in biology of species? There isn't. There isn't. Um, my advisor used to, my graduate advisor used to talk about, you know, if you started walking from down here and all the way up to here, you would encounter people of varying colors and, and shapes and sizes and so on. And nowhere along this line would you say, oh, well, here begins this race, and here ends this race, and here begins a new race, and here is a new race, and here's a new race, and here's a begins. That's just absurd. Um, we are all part of the Homo sapien uh, genome, although there, there's even evidence that we uh, have some Neanderthal in our, in our genes. Um, it's, just, it, it's just nonsense. Um, it's a myth, um, largely to perpetuate group differences which we're going to talk about later in social influence is how you can use race to your advantage if you want to uh, keep people down, if you want to discriminate, if you want to segregate, if you want to have advantage, one way uh, to do that is to divide up your competitors, so to speak. So it's really interesting that um, I received this letter in the mail a few years ago. Um, this is basically an arm of the Ku Klux Klan um, asking me to join them. Um, and I don't really know how they got my name or address or whatever, but there's a lot of really nasty stuff in this letter um, about white supremacy, about white issues. So this is real. If you just think that this is in the news, this is real stuff. And I got this letter, and, it, and, and they're, they're actually hypocrites because they are recruiting me when these are people in my ancestry. They don't know me. I likely have Native American ancestors. Uh, my ancestors from Poland, this is my, my uh, great-grandfather, Michael, and his parents, my great-great-great-grandparents, were, um, were not pure to begin with anyways. Um, they, they were a mix of ethnicities, Polish and German, and, uh, and so on, and, and likely very impoverished, very... Uh, you, you know, working class and so on. So it, 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 there's there's a lot of hypocrisy in this, which is which is when we talk about issues of race. Um, the other reason that we know that myth, race is a myth is that you can take a plane ride, you can get on a plane, be in one country and be considered one race, fly to another country and be a totally different race. So that means a race is constructed by our society, our society defines what you race you are. So it depends on what society you're part of. So there's no, again, no biological or physical manifestation or means to determine someone's race. It's defined by our society. 
okay? If you were in the United States and you had, you, you this used to be the case, if you had one black grandparent, you were considered black. But if you flew to Brazil, you would now be considered white if you had, if you had um, three white grandparents. You'd be considered white. So race is a social construct. It's not biologically determined. It's, de it, 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 it's defined by the society or the culture that we live in. So race is a social construct. But why, it, why do we have race? Well, it's used for a lot of reasons. It's, um, it, it helps us, it, it, it has helped cultures and societies and groups identify their members or your tribe or your group or your, the, the, the people that you're in. It's used for power and influence. It's used for comfort and safety and defense. And, and as we read in the textbook about social psychological, especially experiments of group membership, what we see is we see that this cuts across all sorts of, of divisions, even, and, and we see it in, 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 in fictional cases, but, you know, they're not that far from real. If you know the Harry Potter story, or if you've read the Harry Potter books, you know that, that there are mudbloods and purebloods and this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, I, I remember there's a scene in which a woman is being tried because how could she get a wand? She's not a wizard. She's a, you know, blah, 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 blah. So even in our popular media and our popular books and so on, we see these issues of race. And usually what they're used for is, is to divide us. I like the term ethnicity better because what ethnicity focuses on is a set of practices, behaviors, cultural features, religion, etc. Um, it, it can be associated with where you are from. So, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it likely, I think, is a better term, although we often talk, we, we can even talk about ethnic cleansing, right? Uh, ethnicity is also being used to divide us um, and so on. So um, it's probably a little bit better term than, than race because it refers to a set of cultural practices, not some um, poorly defined or even not defined at all biological, we think, or physical manifestation of differences. So one of the questions that I asked you was about dominant minority and majorities and so on and so forth. And we think of minorities as generally uh, groups of people who have less than 50% of the uh, population, but that's not really how social scientists view uh, minorities. Uh, we identify minorities in terms of power and influence or relative to a dominant group. You know, in this, in this country, for example, women are greater than, make up greater than 50% of the population, but we still consider them a minority group because they have, they don't have the power and influence of men. So where does prejudice and stereotype and discrimination, what are, where do these things come from? Well, we know that they're learned. We know that uh, you're not born prejudiced. You learn it. Uh, Blay in 2005 found that there were some women that joined the, U the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which is a white supremacist organization, if you don't know, founded after the Civil War, largely to um, help keep the South segregated, to oppose any sort of civil, civil rights, to they, they lynched and murdered um, thousands of black people in the uh, southern United States. They're still active. They're still a, a, a group that is organized in the United States. Now, women in the United States, um, the study in it, with, with Blay in two, 2005, found that they had no particular racist feelings uh, when, they, when they entered this group, but that time, that, that changed with time. As they were in this group, they became more and more racist. So we have to believe that there's some sort of indoctrination or some sort of brainwashing going on, that we learn these racist tendencies and racist thoughts and so on. We also know that it comes from other prejudice. So if you're prejudiced against one group, you're more likely to be prejudiced against other outgroups. So Hartley found that people who were prejudiced against Jews and blacks were also more likely to be prejudiced against Wallonians, Pyrenians, and uh, Denarians, which these are made up groups. These are fictional groups. This is like the Slytherins hating the Hufflepuffs. <laughs> this is just fiction. 
it, it, it's not real. That was the funny uh, part of this uh, study, the, uh, the Hartley study. So the origins of prejudice um, come from our, the fact that we do identify with the groups, but the groups are arbitrary, as we learned with the eagles and rattlers, or we're going to read about later. Um, we tend to think of these things as us versus them, where our tribe and where our group membership lies. Uh, if you're not part of our group, then you're out, and uh, we don't like you very much no matter who you are. It's an interesting feature of human, um, human society, although we, we also see it somewhat in primates. Um, Ezekiel did a really interesting study. Uh, he was a Jewish sociologist who studied neo-Nazi groups. And what he found was that I, by identifying or by joining a neo-Nazi group, uh, a neo-Nazi group, you further marginalized y yourself economically. You restricted, uh, employment opportunities were restricted, and educational op options were, were, were reduced, were supplanted. Okay, just think about this. If you join a neo-Nazi group, a skinhead group, you shave your head, and you maybe get a tattoo of a swastika somewhere, it's going to affect how other people interact with you. I mean, you're not likely to get a job. You know, you're not likely to, you know, have a lot of money. You're not likely to be in school very long because you're probably going to be, not going to have many friends. I mean, who wants to hang out with skinheads, right? And the irony of this is that, that by identifying, by joining neo-Nazi groups, you push yourself, you pushed, th these people were pushed into an underclass right next to the source of their oppression, which in most neo-Nazi groups is black men. The reason you don't have a job is black men. The reason you don't have a educational opportunity is black men. The reason you don't have money is black men are taking all my opportunities. That's the neo-Nazi call. But the irony is by joining the neo-Nazi groups, you, you, you actually produced that effect, not, not addressed it, so to speak. So it's a, it, it was an ironic um, and interesting study. We know that there still is discrimination uh, in this country based on uh, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, sex, um, all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of physical features. We know that short people um, have, have fewer economic opportunities than, than tall people. We know that... Um, uh, 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 left-handed people are, are, are more likely to get injured on the job than right-handed people because most of our world is designed for right-handed people. In home mortgages, we know, that this still, we know that what we call redlining still exists. It still exists in Milwaukee. It's still a problem in Milwaukee where people of certain race, certain ethnicities are not granted home mortgages in certain neighborhoods. We know that car loans, totally the same application materials. And if your ethnicity is not the right one, you can be rejected for a car loan. We know that health care is distributed across ethnicities at a differential levels, different levels. Blacks and Latinos are less likely to receive bypass surgery, heart bypass surgery, than white men. And we don't know why this is the case. And this is even by black and Latino doctors. So the, the, the nature of this discrimination is in our institutions, in our society, in our culture, at a level that we don't even understand, we don't even see. That's the really... And remember our lecture on that we, we watched... Um, uh, that, that TED talk on, on sociology, you know, it, it's, it's almost invisible, these powers. And it's, and it's, really, it's really amazing and, and frightening at the same time. Authoritarian personalities, we talked about a little bit, we're talking about a little bit in the textbook uh, writing. These are high re, highly prejudicial people with a strong sense of right and wrong. They, they, they appeal, they, they like strong authorities Ambiguity disturbs them, especially in matters of religion and sex. Uh, and they tend to be older, less educated, less intelligent, and a lower so social class. So, um, you know, to be told what to do 
um, the irony of authoritarian personalities or authoritarians um, is that they rail against authoritarians. They, they talk, you know, they tend to talk a lot about personal freedom and so on and so forth, but it really means them and I don't think others. So why might this be valuable, these, these racial, ethnic, uh, cultural divisions? What, what, why do they exist? Well, one theory is called conflict theory, and it's based on Marxist thinking again. And that is that if you keep groups fighting, if you keep them in conflict, hence the name conflict theory, you'll always have a chief labor force. So this is an economic explanation for racial and ethnic divisions and why they're perpetuated. Because if the other group gets the jobs, that means we won't have them. Our group doesn't have them. We can't let them win. So what we'll do is we'll undervalue our labor so that they don't win. So as a business owner, it might be a good idea to keep the Irish and the Italians fighting because you'll always have cheap labor for your factory. That's the idea of the of, of conflict theory from a Marxist perspective. And I think there's some, some interesting uh, aspects to that. The question becomes, is this a zero-sum game? If one race wins, does the other lose, or, or, or vice versa? And that's a question for um, another, another time. We're going to talk about zero-sum games in, in other places. Last question I think we, we want to talk about here is this group that uh, um, or, or, or an identity that a lot of people are talking about in this country and, uh, and around um, uh, around our, our, our area of the world, and that is Latinos and Hispanics. And believe it or not, the, the word Latino and the word Hispanic used to mean different things. One of them means um, that people can trace their origin back to Spain. So European Spanish are um, sometimes called uh, sometimes refer to this, themselves as Hispanics. If you trace your origins, your ethnicity, your ancestors to indigenous peoples in South and Central America, you might call yourself a Latino. That distinction used to be important to a lot of people. It isn't so much anymore. But this is not a single group. Um, their, um, their countries of origin, um, there's even differences in language. The, the main language spoken in Brazil is Portuguese. It's not Spanish, yet we would consider those, those, those uh, the people in Brazil will consider themselves Latino or Hispanic. There's a lot of class differences. For example, in Cuba, there was a large class segregational uh, uh, social structure at one point in time. Um, um, you know, so there, there's a lot of differences here that um, we need to recognize are at, at play. So um, the last thing I think I want to talk about in this is what we still, uh, discrimination and obstacles for African Americans in our country. Um, we know that the big elephant in the room is still this issue of slavery and how um, it arranged uh, society and social structures for decades, for generations, and can, st can still, uh, we still see remnants of, of those playing out in, in various ways. Uh, the Jim Crow laws that emerged in the early 20th century led to racial segregation in the South. This is where you guys have all heard about separate drinking fountains and separate bus seats, and uh, you couldn't marry, there were laws against interracial, inter you know, interracial marriage, uh, there were separate schools, and so on. Uh, the, the idea that separate uh, but equal was ruled unconstitutional in 1965. That's not that long ago. I mean, it's, it's, you know, 55 years ago. So there are many people still in our society, still uh, working, um, still active, still part of our community that grew up in this segregated society that we had in the southern United States, especially. And it's funny, my father told me a story recently about interactions that he had in New York City in 1962. Um, and he was looking for an apartment with um, 
a couple of guys and they and they kept on getting denied they kept on getting turned down they kept on being told that the apartment was rented one of his potential roommates was a black guy and the they did find an apartment and were accepted the one day that he wasn't with them that's not too long ago and then even in our lifetime rodney king trayvon martin michael brown these are all cases in which uh, black men are being treated very differently than white men by our police and by our community. These are still obstacles that we have to overcome, I think. You might say, well, what about the white kids? And frankly, we don't know about white boys, white young white men and what they're doing. We know that they are, um, they are being, uh, there's some, there's some issues there. Um, <clears throat> We tend to overreact about things and, uh, and, and, and so on. So one of the things that we could think about is, are police a tribe? I mean, if we're concerned about police violence or police management of uh, criminal or pseudo-criminal or possibly criminal behavior, um, how are they? Are they an outgroup? Are they a group themselves? Are they a tribe themselves that has a culture themselves that, um, you know, th those are difficult questions for us to to, to answer. This last thing you can puzzle over a little while, but you can see that this was a Facebook post showing us that uh, arguably that white kids, white, white boys, white young men are killed more often by police than African Americans. But what this doesn't take into a case is the baseline rate, the baseline population. And I've, uh, I've replotted those data in terms of the, uh, the population of um, of uh, the percent of population. So, if if your risk of being killed by the police is equivalent to your uh, your your eth ethnic um, identity, these two bars should be the same. So, um, whites comprise you know points about sixty two percent of our population. But only about 38% of the deaths associated with police. That's reversed in the African American case, where they constitute 14% of the population. They're about 21% of the victims of police killings. So um, there is some uh, 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 evidence here of of actually uh, some some racism in the way we. Uh, manage criminal behavior at least. All right, so we'll move on to the next topic. Thanks for listening.